men are good. Men are good. Men are not these violent rapists. You know, that is, you know, a tiny fraction. But that's not, that doesn't describe men in general. In general, men are good. So do you think there needs to be like a reworking of um, just perceptions of men in general and through men's groups and men's studies? We yeah, can like yeah. Shift it? Yeah, I think there's a lot to a lot of work to do from both the women and the men. You know, the women need to understand a little bit more about men, but the men need to understand more about themselves. That's why the shed thing is so important. You know about the shed no. movement in Australia? They have what's called a men's shed. I was there in Australia in uh, 1999 giving workshops, and it was on men and grief and whatever. And, and uh, when I talk, the the women would say, "Well, do you know about men's sheds?" I said, no. And they'd tell me, they said, man, shed, it's his place. He goes, he's got a TV or his tools or his whatever. And, you know, it's, it's his spot. It's his safe place, basically, is what they were saying. And I said, well, do you ever go to the shed? No, we never go to the shed. That's his space. They were so respectful of his space and giving him that place. Now in Australia, they're starting to pick up the shed movement so that there are local sheds for men to go to. And when someone dies, they donate their tools to the shed. And so the shed has tools and has things to do, you know, where men are shoulder to shoulder working on a project. You know, some guy probably has a, a lot of, of knowledge about woodwork, and so he helps someone else make a, a plaque or whatever. And you know what happens is these men are, are working together on these projects? They're talking and they're telling their stories. You know, that's what men do. When my father died, my brother and I had made the box for his ashes, you know, and that week before he was buried, we made this box and all his friends would come in and the men would be out in the garage working on this box. And as we're working on the box, what are we doing? We're telling stories about my dad. You know, we're telling him about what it was like when we were little and, and the older men were telling us about what it was like in the last, you know, couple of years. And we're sitting there telling stories. Now, could you take that same group of men, put them in a circle and say, okay, talk about it? No. But when we were working on a project together, it flowed was easy peasy. The same thing is true for these sheds. You know, as men come and they work on things, they find it's just so easy to be able to kind of talk about things or not talk about things. It's their choice. You know, it's not, we're sitting down and talking about our feelings today. No! We're working on this project if you want to work on it. And once men get into that kind of scenario and they feel safe, they can then tell their story. And we really haven't talked about the different ways that men tell their story, and we should probably talk a little bit about that yeah, because it, it's important. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was at St. Francis, I realized there were three basic ways that men tell their story, through creativity, through practicality, and through thinking. And we'll tell a story about a creative way. You know, Eric Clapton. You know, Clapton's son died. He fell out of a, a New York skyscraper window. And he was, I think he was four years old at the time. And Clapton was crushed. And Clapton went into seclusion, basically. And he was two years sober at the time. And so he says in his autobiography, he said, I, I pulled back, I went to meetings, and I played my guitar. Those are the two things that I did. And he went and he played over and over and over again. And he says, you know, I didn't go in there to write songs. I went in there just to play because my guitar, as it is always has been, is my salvation. Oh, that's a great quote. And Clapton says, my guitar is my salvation. When he was in this key, Clapton called it a waking nightmare. It's like a waking nightmare. The only thing that was stable for him that could pull him was this guitar. And he'd play and he'd play and he'd play. And over the months, three th songs started coming up. That's when he wrote the three songs. Uh, Tears in Heaven, which most people know about, which is actually a song about will we meet after death? It's not really about his grief. There's another song he wrote during that time called My Father's Eyes. And oh, it's a beautiful song where he's thanking his son for giving him the opportunity to see his father's eyes through his son's eyes because he never met his father. Oh, beautiful song. But the third song is probably the most important. It's a song titled The Circus Left Town. And Clapton had taken his son to the circus the night before his death. And the song is about how that one time to the circus is going to have to last his son a lifetime. <laughs> you 
if you don't cry when you listen to that song on YouTube, you're a daggone rock because it's just so beautiful and you can just feel Clapton's grief. And can you see how he was playing that song and writing that song? The grief had to come up. He was feeling everything as he was doing this action of playing his guitar. People were telling him, You're, you need to get out and do things. Clapton said, no, I need to sit here and play my guitar. So can you see how the action of his guitar and his creativity connected him in with the pain and the loss? That's what men do.